There is a huge issue that no blockchain has yet solved. An issue that might stop blockchain technology from reaching mass adoption. And an issue where the most relevant blockchains and the most brilliant minds in this space are working hard to try to solve. I'm talking about the blockchain trilemma, and in this video, I'll explain you exactly what is this trilemma in very simple terms, and why is it so important and so hard to solve. As you've heard in the intro, the blockchain trilemma is likely the biggest and most important issue to be solved by today's cryptocurrencies and blockchain. This is because this is a problem that can really limit the adoption of blockchain and blockchain technology if not properly solved. We can't have mass adoption in blockchain without this problem fixed and the benefits that blockchain provides to the wider world can in fact be limited, very limited. Many of the most recent blockchains have claimed to solve the blockchain trilemma and there are many theoretical solutions, let's say, for this problem, but the reality is that no blockchain uh, was able to solve it in practice. But for you to better understand uh, this issue, let's dive deeper into what is the blockchain trilemma. So basically, the blockchain trilemma uh, comes from the fact that there are three crucial characteristics that a blockchain must have in order to perform the promises of blockchain and those characteristics are uh, scalability security and decentralization these are crucial for any blockchain to work or else you won't be in fact able to provide the benefits that come uh, with uh, being uncorruptible with um, serving a wider range of people and many other benefits we know that blockchain can have in the world but let's dive deeper into the actual characteristics and what they mean so that you can understand um, a little bit more about this issue so basically we have scalability as the first one and scalability refers to the capacity of a blockchain to be scalable and process multiple transactions this is a crucial characteristic of course to be able to reach mass adoption um, as well as you know, being able to feel the purpose that many blockchains have of being um, a financial hub, of being a financial solution for countries, of actually being a currency for a certain country, for example, you need for that to have the capacity of processing a lot of transactions in a significantly fast way and with some degree of confidence and assurance for the users. Then we have security. Security is naturally all about how secure it is to use the network. For example, it's possible to easily corrupt and take control over the network and its rules. Or, you know, is the network secure to possible hacks and other attacks that can bring a blockchain down? Or that can, for example, benefit the attacker at the expense of other users? Uh, you know, is the blockchain uh, able to stay up and keep on running constantly and be something that, you know, every user knows that's going to be there all the time to provide them with the transactions and to act as the ledger for these transactions and for this exchange of value. You know, a secure um, blockchain should be capable to have all these characteristics to resist any kind of attack and remain lively and incorruptible. And then we have decentralization that is super important. Arguably, it can be, alongside the security, one of the most important characteristics of blockchain. And it's certainly the most revolutionary one that makes blockchain completely different from our current solutions. Different and better, I would say. Basically, decentralization contributes naturally to the security and liveliness of a blockchain. This is because, you know, if you have several decentralized nodes making uh, the blockchain al alive and verifying the blockchain and in processing these transactions, you know, several decentralized computers spread all around the world and managed by different individuals, then even if some nodes go down, the blockchain will keep on running. You'll have not one unique point of failure to attack. You need to attack multiple computers to be able to actually stop this network. 
Besides that, these computers, of course, uh, not only put transactions into the blockchain and validate transactions and the transfer of value between users of blockchain, but they also have incentives to verify these transactions to make sure that no one misbehaves inside the, the network. So basically, with decentralization, a blockchain is more resistant to things like censorship, is more resilient. Besides the added security of having the no, no centralized point of failure and also being either to corrupt all the nodes you need in order to gain control over the network because if you have a lot of nodes spread all around the world it's very hard to do so but what is this blockchain trilemma exactly well it rises from the fact that it that so far has been hard very hard for any blockchain to be able to have these three characteristics in the same at the same time in practice blockchains always have to choose to sacrifice at least one of these characteristics to be able to focus on the other two characteristics and really deliver on, on them, you always have a trade-off. And, uh, you know, so far there hasn't been any solution to make sure that you can have the three um, characteristics well developed. Let's look at Bitcoin, for example. You know, we can say Bitcoin is a very secure network. It has been around for several years without going down. Maybe even the most secure blockchain, you know, at because of that, because of the time it has been uh, working properly since inception. Many have tried to hack or attack Bitcoin since its inception to gain control over the network, but with no success. And the larger the network gets, the harder it is. The most efficient way to control this blockchain would be, in fact, a 51% attack. But considering that to do so, you need to have over 51% of all the computing power in the Bitcoin network, that is almost impossible. Just for you to get uh, an ocean, the necessary hashing power to carry such an attack on Bitcoin, according to Google Eximates, would be around $10 billion at current prices, something that in practice would likely be much more expensive because... You know, if you had someone trying to acquire so much equipment at once, the prices would increase because the demand um, would be much larger and much larger than current producers could deliver on. Bitcoin is also pretty decentralized. You have several nodes and machines being responsible to validate the Bitcoin network spread all over the world. Although we do have to admit that decentralization might be progressively decreasing as computing power requirements to regularly mint blocks are increasing, what leads to more mining pools, more people coming, coming together under one entity, and basically the person in charge of the entity, even though it has to answer to the people providing the mining power, still has the power to make the decisions at the end of the day. And of course, we also have a lot of large companies being uh, coming into Bitcoin and producing the majority of blocks. The positive thing is as you'll have more other companies from already existing companies and institutions coming in and with a lot of funds, then I think the competition between these companies will certainly help decentralize Bitcoin. However, Bitcoin is not very scalable. You know, Bitcoin can only process around seven transactions per second. And, you know, that's not even close to what you would need um, to be used as a global payment method, considering that, for example, Visa on average needs to process around 1700 transactions per second every day. You know, it's relatively easy to get to a stage where the Bitcoin network starts getting crowded. And we see that it, during the bull market. And with the transaction costs increasing in order to get your transaction to be prioritized and added early into the blockchain, this would leave naturally a lot of people with less funds, less monetary capacity, um, completely stopped from interacting with the, the Bitcoin blockchain. Other blockchains like Ethereum and Cardano, for example, followed a similar path to Bitcoin. They ended up prioritizing decentralization and security at the expense of scalability, at least initially, because these blockchains also have a, a plan to solve the blockchain trilemma. However, of course, here it's important to notice that while Ethereum has gas fees raising when you have more usage of the blockchain in Cardano that doesn't happen. You know, blockchain transaction costs don't really change. Even when the network is crowded, your transaction will just take longer to go through.
But what are the plans of these blockchains to actually solve this trilemma? Well, starting with Ethereum, they, it is focused on basically leveraging layer 2s and, and sharding to solve the scalability issue, while Cardano is leveraging Hydra and uh, layer 2s to solve decentralization and to reach millions of transactions per second, what would actually be great, but it's not yet possible in practice. Uh, but that's the point. We still need to see these solutions working in practice, how they would affect the other two um, characteristics, like, for example, decentralization, as they could potentially reduce it. We'll explain, in fact, some of the limitations that some of these scaling solutions have uh, further ahead in this video. So stay tuned if you want to learn about that. On a very quick side note, if this video is being informative to you, then please leave it a like, share it with anyone eager to learn about blockchain. And of course, if you haven't yet, please subscribe so you don't miss out any content in the future. We have some great videos coming, a lot of them with a lot of education about blockchain, but also cool videos about projects that you should watch. Now let's get back to the video. Then we have blockchains like Solana, and that have opted to first focus on decentralization and scalability. But, you know, that has definitely affected security with the chain going down multiple times when there is more usage. Of course, you know, Solana is a very specific case where you can also argue whether it is really decentralized or not. You can have several validators, but only a group of a few developers is manually turning the blockchain back on whenever it goes down. However, we do need to give some merit to Solana for trying a completely different approach and for having what it seems to be a vibrant community with a lot of interesting developers and ideas. Other blockchains like XRP, for example, focus on scalability and security of the blockchain as they process a lot of transactions and want to be secure, reliable and a lively blockchain. And that is in fact crucial for them as they need to be trusted as they are working with financial institutions and processing financial transactions for these institutions. However, XRP has a limited number of nodes and, you know, it's not very decentralized. So, you know, clearly they opt by giving up a bit on the decentralization side of their blockchain. But as you can see here, this is a sacrifice that every blockchain is making. You know, it's a sacrifice that happens to the difficulty of conciliating these three characteristics at the same time. For example, imagine that for you, the most important important characteristic is decentralization. And then, for example, you really want to secure and assure that your blockchain is secure for users, they can rely on it, it will never go down, etc. Then as things stand right now, you need to sacrifice on security. You'll need to make sure that uh, the information uh, relative to transactions is properly distributed and also validated across the whole network to have decentralization and security. The more validators you're able to have with your blockchain, the more decentralized the blockchain will be. And naturally, the longer it will take for the transaction and the blocks to be spread and validated across the network, especially if you have processes in place that take a while to assure the security of the blockchain. This validation will naturally take time, meaning that it will end up in doing how fast and scalable your blockchain can be to assure that it is in fact both decentralized and secure. Even though right now we do get the sensation that this is a problem for the past, we don't speak about it so often because we have these theoretical solutions. But the reality is we don't know that in practice those solutions will work. Sure, you have, for example, layer 2s on Ethereum, but while that does solve the problem of scalability, it doesn't actually solve the blockchain trilemma. You know, this is because even though the layer 1 uh, that ends up securing the layer 2 is secure and decentralized, the reality is that the layer 2s that exist right now are pretty centralized and validated at most by a couple of nodes. This means that these layer 2s end up being a centralized point of failure. Even though they are faster and more scalable, they are not decentralized. And considering that, that you have only a few nodes validating the blockchain, in some cases only one, as in the, as in the case of Base, uh, 
you, you can even argue if it is that secure. Base, for example, has gone down already. And it's for that reason that, you know, we don't really solve the blockchain trilemma with layer twos as they stand today. So far, until we have other implementations or other technologies for layer twos, the reality is that we'll need to keep on working to solve the blockchain trilemma because with layer twos, we just find a way to go around the problem of scalability on major blockchains. But the reality is that the transactions that happen in the layer two and all the funds that you have there could be at risk until the moment that the layer two passes all the information and stores it into the layer one. So by increasing scalability, you seem to be, you know, decreasing um, security and decentralization when using a layer two, even if it's just something temporary. So we have your real problem that needs to be solved. But the thing is that the blockchain that solves it won't necessarily be the blockchain that will have the highest block adoption or the blockchain that wins it all. Because whether we like it or not, most people and most users don't really care about things like this blockchain trilemma, like decentralization or security. We just think about it when things go wrong. So eventually, if something happens, and let's hope not, that goes wrong with one of these blockchains that don't solve the blockchain trilemma, then we, we, we should watch a move to these blockchains that will. But of course, you here watching the video and learning this in advance, you'll know that the blockchains that will be able to fight this trilemma should be, in fact, the ones you should use from the beginning. You should adopt as much as you can, because at the end of the day, they are the only blockchains that are technologically ready for mass adoption and that won't fail us in the future. So eventually, I think it's only a matter of time until those blockchains are the ones being adopted and used. And it can be the blockchains we have today if they are able to solve the problem, or it can be completely new blockchains that are still to come and that will be ready to present us with a solution. Congratulations on staying until this point of the video. I'm not sure if you noticed it, but you just learned a lot. You've learned more about blockchain trilemma and its characteristics. You've understand all the major blockchains of our time are still looking to solve this problem in practice and even realize why it is so hard to go around and to solve this blockchain trilemma. You also know exactly how the limitations of this trilemma might in fact stop or um, delay, I think more delay, crypto adoption and crypto mass adoption if not if they are not solved and realize the limitations for the solutions that we are currently applying to solve this blockchain trilemma and that they are in fact still a bit far away from actually solving it. If you want to keep on learning relevant crypto concepts as you're doing here in this video, you should then watch the video that will be here in the end page about DAOs. DAOs are in fact novel institutions that are facilitated by blockchain. DAOs leverage smart contracts to have a clear on-chain voting structure and rules to organize the DAO um, to be incorruptible and have an infrastructure for individuals where they can join forces and collaborate towards a goal. DAOs might actually be a really empowering, powerful infrastructure for the future, one that allows each of us to collaborate and compete with larger companies in the future if we do come together under these DAOs. So certainly a video you should watch. And on my side, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for supporting. And I'll see you in the video about DAOs.